Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Brickyard. I'm Andrea Thompson and today we're continuing with our new series um, that we started last year in October of 2022 and uh, the series is called Intersectional Poetica and this is a, a series that allows us to get in depth with spoken word artists on a diversity of topics. So this month, we're celebrating Black History Month by showcasing the work of four legends, really, of Canadian spoken word. And today, it is my pleasure to be chatting with Dwayne Morgan. Hi, Dwayne. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm excellent. Awesome. Okay, so I don't know if there's anybody in spoken word, especially Canadian spoken word, who doesn't know who you are. But in case there is, I'm going to introduce you and share your bio here. Dwayne Morgan began his career in spoken word in 1993, affectionately called the godfather of Canadian spoken word by his peers. Morgan is the author of 14 published and nine audio collections of his work. Morgan is a 2022 winner of the Toronto Arts Foundation Celebration of Cultural Life Award, 2016 finalist for the Premier's Award for Excellence in the Arts, and a 2013 inductee into the Scarborough Walk of Fame. To date, Morgan has shared his work in 18 countries internationally. Wow. Yes, busy guy. Um, so Dwayne, thank you for taking time to speak with us today. Um, in these interviews, we've been doing a few different interviews for Brickyard, and I always want to start with a question, which is a bit of a cliche, but I think really important, especially for you know people who are just interested, young people, people who are just like wanting to get into the art themselves. How did you? What was your what was your introduction into the art of spoken word? Um, I mean, it's interesting because um, I had no idea I had talent. So I would go out and watch um, spoken word shows. They they weren't called spoken word shows at that time. Spoken word wasn't even a term that was used back back then. It was just people were just doing poetry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they call it performance poetry or whatever the case may be. But a gentleman by the name of Black Cat. I uh, had a series called All Truth Spoken, Our Poetry in Motion. And um, there were such hugely popular shows. It was kind of like every time he did one, that was like the place to be. And so I would just go there, uh, not knowing that I had talent or not knowing that eventually I would be doing any of that kind of stuff. And um, in one of my final years of high school, I was putting on a talent show for Black History Month. And I had all these friends who were rappers, singers, dancers. And I realized that, you know, all my friends were going to be in the spotlight and no one really cares about who's organizing the show. So mm -hmm. I wanted to be in the spotlight as well. So I had to figure out, you know, how do you get on stage in a talent show with no talent? Mm -hmm. And I decided the easiest thing would probably be to to write a poem. And I, I wrote a poem to be in that show. And that poem changed everything else that happened in life. So I was never a kid that, you know, that wrote, that journaled, that mm -hmm. did anything of the sort. I'm actually, you know, a shy introvert um, who somehow has uh, made a way speaking to and in front of people. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to just have to abandon my questions, um, which happens <laughs> when something interesting comes up and something interesting has come up. I mean, I knew your um, background and I also knew that you are a shy, introverted person. And I think that's fascinating. Um, I'm also, as you know, a spoken word artist. I'm great with friends. I can be really outgoing, but um terrified of strangers and I think there's this um not so much anymore but you know as a kid growing up I think there's this cliche that if you get up on stage you're this like you know outgoing personality that this is like a natural thing for you can you speak a little bit about that that kind of tension of um of who you are as a private person and who you are on stage yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of of artists, uh, contrary to you know what you just mentioned, that are actually very shy and 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 introverted, um, and know how to turn it on and turn it off. Uh, and they are what we learn is 
how to prepare a certain amount of energy that is going to be needed to get through a certain experience. So whether it's a two hour show and in that show, you're going to perform for, for half an hour, but the other hour and a half, you're still, you know, engaging with people and stuff. It's still taking a lot out of you. So we learn how to prepare ourselves to navigate that environment and then have some kind of self-care routine for how we get back to ourselves um, so that we're not feeling, you know, burnt out by what it is that, that we're doing. So, um, you know, I just kind of have this, this switch where it's like, I hear my name and it's like, okay, bam, I'm I'm on. And it's go, 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 go. And the minute I'm done my set, people will usually see me at the back of the room or on my phone or or whatever. And it's not, you know, people might think it's it's rude or stuck up or whatever the case. It's just me being back in my shell, my comfort zone. Like all of my friends know not to call me on the phone. It's rare. Like that's for emergencies only. Like I just mm-hmm. don't answer my phone. Like people call me, I'll let it go to voicemail and then I'll, call back whenever, you know, I feel I have the energy to do that. But if I can write to you, that's, that's my preferred way to, to communicate, you know, with people. And it just allows me to uh, preserve my energy on my own terms. Um, So I think, you know, for, for me, it's really been, you know, trying to learn that about myself because, you know, when you're an introvert, you know, you don't even realize that that other side exists. So I had to, you know, find that other side, learn that other side, and then figure out how do I make these two parts of me coexist. Mm, That's interesting. Wow. Thank you for getting into that. Um, Yeah. So, uh, you know, you're talking about managing your energy. One of the things that I've noticed about you and that, um, you know, researching about you, I keep finding people mentioning it in interviews, um, is how, how much you do. You know, you've always had... Uh, it seems to me, a million projects on the go at the same time. Um, two of your kind of flagship projects that you've been doing um, for a really long time are these huge showcases, I think at one time, and maybe still, uh, definitely I know at one time, were the biggest spoken word events that happen in the country. And that's the When Brothers Speak and When Sisters Speak showcases. Um, I, I would love to hear you speak a little bit about why why you started these events and why you thought it was important um, to create this venue for Black artists. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of my stories are really <laughs> interesting because, you know, it's not like I sat there and said, hey, I want to create this event for, you know, Black artists. It's so not how it happened. So, um, you know, when I was... Well, even still, I get a lot of emails. I'm part of, you know, all these different, you know, newsletters and festivals, you know, so I'm I'm constantly getting emails about things that are happening in different parts of the world and stuff. So back in like 1998 or so, uh, I got an email about a poetry slam that was happening in Philadelphia. And at the time, I had no idea what a poetry slam was. I'd never heard the term used before. And I had prided myself, um, you know, on kind of knowing quite a bit about, you know, poetry stuff, especially as far as, you know, racialized people went. So I was really curious about what is this thing that I've never heard of. Um, So my nature is to borrow my mom's van, get some friends, and we did a road trip to Philadelphia to find out what this thing was. And uh, went there, ended up in the event, and just ended up meeting amazing Uh, poets. And I was like, it is so unfortunate that Toronto will never get the privilege of hearing what I just heard. Mm -hmm. So then I had to figure out what can I do to get these artists to Toronto? Mm -hmm. And that's how When Brothers Speak was born. It was to create a, uh, a vehicle that would allow American artists to get to Toronto and create infrastructure so that Toronto artists can now meet American artists and try to negotiate getting, you know, to the States and stuff like that. And, you know, a couple of years after doing Brother Speak, I felt that somebody would have uh, created When Sisters Speak as a natural offshoot of me doing When Brother Speak, and nobody did. 
So then I just said, well, okay, well, if no one's going to do it, I'll do it. So then I created When Sisters Speak to to compliment when when brothers speak. And both shows have now been going for over 20 years. Mm. Yeah, over 20 years. Okay, so that's something that I was thinking about is, um, and I think this is something that's really important for for spoken word artists today and, and, and emerging artists to remember is um, that the arts community was different before the internet, you know? So was this kind of like pre-internet or like, I guess, baby internet times like that played into part of it was that you had to bring the artists physically to the city in order for people to see them? Yeah, absolutely. Because there wasn't really, you know, YouTube and social media and stuff in the way that we know of it now. And, you know, even with, you know, artists that I, I mentor, you know, sometimes I'll I'll show them stuff that I had back in the day, which is like, you know, pages upon pages of just names and phone numbers. And I would tell them, you know, in my day when One Brother Speak was happening, I had to call all of these numbers mm -hmm. one by one. And say, hey, I'm doing this show, When Brothers Speak, blah, blah, blah. So it's not like, you know, you just go on Instagram and you post something and a thousand people see it. It's like, no, one by one, you had to reach people. I had to put flyers and envelopes and send them out in Canada Post to people's houses. Like, that's how I had to do things because that's what we had then. And I think, you know, that created a, a work ethic um, in me that has allowed me to do things for as long as I have, and also um, maybe makes me somewhat impatient with some of the younger artists that I mentor who have all of this stuff at their fingertips and mm -hmm. can't figure out what to do with it. And it's like, but it's all there. It's 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 right there. You know, like if I had that, I just imagine, think to myself, what would I have done if I had all of that? Like I, I didn't have all of that and I've created all of the things that I've created. So, you know, I don't I don't believe, you know, for the younger artists coming up that like there's really no excuse. They're like you have more people, more audience at your fingertips than ever before in human history. And if you can't figure out what to do with that then, you know, I don't even know what to tell you. <laughs> Reminds me of that old cliche. When I was your age, me, you said, <laughs> 10 miles through the snow backwards. Uh, well, but it's true. It's true. And I like what you say about how it, it created a, a work ethic in you. I'm sure you, now, yeah, you find you find things a lot easier. Um, one of the things also uh, I wanted to speak to you about, and I heard you speak about it before, and I, I, I was interested to to have you repeat that um, or speak on it again is how you have self-published you know you have, is it 14 14 mm -hmm. or 16 books 14 books so you know you made the decision in your in your career uh, to self-publish and I don't know if it was always a choice um, which leads to uh, you know a bigger discussion about the publishing industry and how friendly it's traditionally been to black artists but um, so I guess this is a, a wide question you can go anywhere you want in here um, but you still self-publish and you've got quite a name for yourself and so um, I guess that definitely now this is a choice so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that the evolution of you um, taking that route as an as a writer. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, when I was coming up, as I mentioned before, spoken word wasn't even a term. Um, you know, you know, some of the the story in terms of, you know, not being accepted into the, you know, League of Canadian Poets and stuff like that. We were literally pushed to the margins of, yeah, you're you're not really one of us kind of things. And and it wasn't any different, you know, with the publishing world. You know, I would send out my work and you know, receive rejection letters. There's no audience for this. We don't like what you're talking about. Like all sorts of things that to me was, you know, extremely disrespectful. And I thought that for a lot of people, those letters would probably break their spirit mm -hmm. uh, and make them reconsider if they should ever write again. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, that's not my personality. So every time a door closed I was like okay I'm gonna show you yeah <laughs> then I was just like let me figure out how to do this and you know at that time self-publishing wasn't like how it is today self-publishing is an actual thing today 
Mm -hmm. uh, or you can do print on demand and stuff like that. That did not exist back in these days. It was print a thousand or more. And that's just kind of how it worked. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had to bet on myself. I had to bet that I could print a thousand and sell them. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the benefits of being a spoken word artist is that you could take advantage of selling on the spot. If people like what you're what you're doing, what you said, what you just did on stage, you come off the stage, the audience is right there. You're not dependent on, oh, go to the store. And, and no, it's right here. So, you know, you, you just sell it on the spot. And uh, that the first book I did, so well over, uh, I think over 2,000 of those took the money from that did the next book. And I've always just reinvested the money back into the next uh, project. And, um, you know, when the technology got there, um, you know, when I, when I tour and I travel, we always make the joke all the time because I'm like the only poet or maybe even artist really that I see that walks around with a debit machine wherever he goes. Right. And mm -hmm. I've had a debit machine for like 15 years mm -hmm. and I just travel around the country in different places. And people are like shocked that this guy has a debit machine and there's so much money that I've made from people who said, Oh man, I don't have cash. If I knew that there was going to be stuff on sale, I would have brought money. I'm like, Oh, I have a debit machine just making things, you know, happen. Um, so again, it's just really looking at um, how do you utilize the technology that's there with your own creativity um, to do things. And because, again, I had a very community approach to what I was doing, you know, Lillian Allen, you know, had a model for, for this as well, where it's like, hey, you know what, if you're going to put this thing out in November, in March, let people know you're going to do a book in November. It's going to be $15, but if they buy it in March, it's going to be $10. And you just take all that money from March and use it to print the book. So you've actually paid for it. You, you send it to all of those people. They get it autographed. They're like, wow, I have it, it before everybody else. And then in November, the book comes out and it's already paid for. You've already paid off the printer, all that kind of stuff. So even uh, you know, crowdfunding, we did before it was even a term, before anybody coined crowdfunding, before there was Indiegogo and Kickstarter and all of these things, we did that as a community, as artists, getting our community and our audience to invest in us and then creating a product based on that investment. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I wanted to switch gears a little bit, I guess. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, just the the art of spoken word and the relationship to the black community um and also i guess it it, it is related to the idea of self-publishing um which is vernacular do, do you feel that uh well okay so a two-part question first off why do you think so many um black artists go veer towards spoken word is that because of the the publishing gatekeepers still being a force and do you part two um <laughs> do you feel that um if that is the case an offshoot of that would be um a tendency for black artists to express themselves in a certain sort of poetic maybe a more kind of traditional eurocentric based poetic rather than um a more authentic voice that's closer to the way that closer to black vernacular? Um, well, I mean, I think the, the literary slash um, publishing gatekeepers still exist and they're completely out of touch. And things like, um, you know, the pandemic and the technology have uh, created a sense of urgency where they are now trying to stay relevant. They're now trying to figure out oh, how do we navigate this new system that has put a lot of power into the hands of individual artists who don't necessarily need them in the same kind of ways that they've always been needed? Mm -hmm. So I always say, you know, to the to young people I work with that it's the greatest time to be an independent artist if you're willing to do the work, if you're willing to utilize the technology that you have, you know, at your disposal. Um, another piece to that is that, you know, as a community, we have always um, had a connection to the oral tradition, whether it is, you know, how 
we told stories, you know, in in Africa, whether you look at, um, you know, Trinidad, the the tradition of ex tempo. Uh, if you look at dub poetry coming out of um, Jamaica, if you and, and I wrote an article for the the Writers Union of Canada, and I and I looked at uh, because you know people always complained or criticized me for these poetry slams that I was doing. They're like, oh, there shouldn't be you know competition in poetry and art and whatever. I'm like, just competition in everything. If two people put out a book, there's a competition. Who's going to sell more copies than the other one? Like competition is everywhere. It's it's a natural part of the world that we live in. And, you know, so, so the griot tradition had a competition, uh, ex tempo in the Caribbean competition, uh, dub poetry, dance hall competition, hip hop, freestyle battles, ciphers, competitions. If you even look at stand up comedy and, and the dozens, mama jokes, competition, like, so as a community, that has always been something that we have done. We have always looked at our relationship with words and competed with one another in a, in a way that is uplifting of each other, not necessarily to be better than someone, but we understand that iron sharpens iron and we compete with each other to bring the best out of each other. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I want to read, I was just writing a note about to uh, remind myself, I want to read that article uh, from the Writers mm. Union. Is it available somewhere? Um, it might be on their website, but if, if you can't okay. find it, uh, I got it. I can send it to you. Okay, awesome. Awesome. I want to uh, check it out. Uh, so when we're thinking about, you know, storytelling, I'm wondering for you as an individual artist, what is your, um, what, what's your creative process? How do you, you come about an idea um, and how does that turn into a piece that you end up sharing? Uh, I mean, it's such an interesting question because I'm not even sure if I have a process to be honest like I just I just live life like I'm not <laughs> one of those people who I gotta write for 30 minutes every day or anything like there's times like months go by and um I'll write nothing and then mm -hmm. there was a week this summer where I wrote like 25 poems in one week and mm -hmm. it's like you know so it's really like whenever it comes whenever it shows up then I just give it that time and that space mm -hmm. um but other than that I'm I'm just living life and doing things and I think it's through living life that I get the perspectives and the ideas to to put into into the poem so mm -hmm. um, I really just kind of wait for the inspiration to show up and then when it does I just create the space for it to create something um, that I think will resonate with people. Okay, well, I think this is a perfect segue for uh, an opportunity for people to hear a little Dwayne Morgan in action. Do you want to share a piece of this? All right, for sure, for sure. Um, there's a line out the door of 13-year-old Black boys dressed in their Sunday's best, accompanied by parents looking stressed, but understanding this rite of passage, it's picture day. So we dress up our teens and make them say cheese, continue this routine every two years, images archived online in case our sons die gone too soon. This way. The media can be given the official images that we want used, not the ones that they always seem to find that have us looking like we've lived a life of crime and are unworthy of compassion, empathy, inquiries, investigations, and nobody wants to be here. This is no one's idea of a fun afternoon, a good use of family time, taking pictures in case our sons die, but everyone knows that a picture says a thousand words, and this might be the only obituary spoken heard because we are living in a world where more black boys will die in Chicago than soldiers during the Iraq war, where black boys will continue to die from being poor, with poor options and poor choices, leaving us pouring out liquor, spilling spirits for lost spirits, because black lives only seem to matter when they're dead, so every month we put aside funds for our sons education slash funeral fund we live in the now tomorrow seems like a cruel joke when you grow up in communities that make you play hunger games for survival creating rivals out of street codes often outlined in chalk in our street codes we think we're dying prematurely they think we're dying right on time so every two years we reluctantly join this line ensuring that the first suit he wears is not the one that he's buried in that he realized how handsome he is, that he gains the desire to live so that these pics can be used for nothing more than special occasions and milestones that we celebrate. So let me fix your tie. Stand up straight. Smile, son. It's picture day. Thank you. Wow, that was powerful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, 
Yeah, I I love that. I've heard that that piece before, but every time you know, I find this with spoken word artists and jazz spoken word in general. Every time you hear it, it's like you pick up different different elements, different things stand out to you. Um, one of the one of the questions that I I I definitely wanted to ask you is um you know just as a as a as an elder in the scene as a you know no offense taken I think like we're around the same age so <laughs> um, um but you know and as a mentor you know I know you work with a lot of young people what would you say other than you know I mean there's the the technical things about um that you've shared about you know how to make the most of the technology that we have, how to make the most of promoting yourself, um, how to tap into a kind of entrepreneurial spirit as a creative person, um, but at more as a, you know, because there's also this element of how do we have the courage to reach inside ourselves and speak our truth to the world. Um, in, the, in respect to that, what advice would you give to young people who, might be you know who are looking at you, at you as a role model but haven't necessarily taken that first step yeah i mean great question i think you know that's something that i had to learn especially as um you know as an introvert like you're like well how do i talk about all of this stuff and everybody's going to be there you know looking at me and staring at me and and you know all this stuff runs through your head about what you think the audience is probably thinking which is probably very far from the truth but you convince yourself that everyone is going to be thinking about all of these kinds of things and um what i ended up having to learn is that you know sometimes people would ask me like how did you come up with that poem idea and I'm like I have no idea like I was literally just driving and this idea came to me and then I decided to write it so I realized that I am simply just a conduit between inspiration and people mm -hmm. and ideas come to me and I do something with them and I give them away so when I realized that I am now simply just a vessel, I can think less about myself mm -hmm. and think more about my responsibility to bring this idea from myself to other people. Mm -hmm. So now I'm not worried about what are people thinking about me. I'm more worried about are they getting the message? Is the message that came to me being transmitted to them? Mm -hmm. um, and I think when I put the onus on them, it makes it so much easier to just be me and to be free to do whatever it is that I want to do. Mm, I love that. It takes the pressure off. It definitely takes. Oh, absolutely. The off. I see that sometimes when people are, are performing for the first time, it's, um, you know, or even in people with lots of experience performing that there's almost this like going can be this going in and out of yourself like okay now I'm outside of myself kind of <laughs> observing myself okay wait no now I'm back inside the poem mm -hmm. so, yeah I think that staying inside the poem is definitely the place to be sure. um yeah so just one more question really just thinking about this idea of Black History Month taking a month to celebrate Black history um how you know i know with some people there's a, a, a there's a controversial thought it's um you know thank you for giving us you know this time but um why is there only one month do you have any thoughts about black history month as uh as this uh, you know this annual celebration that you'd like to share um i mean i think the month is important and i think it's it's great that people usually, unfortunately, Black people say, well, why is it only a month? When we get to the point where white people en masse say, why is this a month? Why isn't this integrated? Then we might start to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but as it stands now, um, I think the month is um, really important for many of us who are artists. This is, um, you know, Black Employment Month. Black because, Employment Month. Yeah. You know, we know that we are busy like every day because everybody wants to hear from us. We wish we could be heard from the rest of the year in the same kind of way. But, you know, we take it um, as it comes. Um, but I think it's, it's definitely... Um, important. And there are so many contributions that we often 
um, don't speak of. There are contributions that are Canadian contributions that often get lost to American contributions. And I think it's really important to, to have um, the time to reflect on the things that we have done and contributed, uh, you know, to the world. And, you know, again, you know, I do a lot of work, you know, in the schools and, and with young people. And it's always interesting to me that February is the time when people want to speak about, you know, slavery and stuff. And, and so many young people are absolutely turned off, you know, by this idea of that's, you know, how their ancestors are represented, even though it is historical. But I, I you know, I, I speak to teachers and administrators and I say, you know, um, the fact that there are so many Black people in Brazil speaking Portuguese as a result of Portugal um, starting the Atlantic slave trade, that is European history. That is not Black history. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you talk about colonization, that is Britain's history. That is white history. That is spent, that is not Black history. So our history was interrupted by what these people did. So if you're going to talk about slavery, why not talk about, well, even while these people were doing this to us, what did we do? Mm -hmm. What did we create? What did we invent? What did we give to the world? Even when the world was showing us how much we were hated. Now that in and of itself changes the narrative so that even young people can be like, yo, when these people tried to break us, we created the fridge. We created this. We did this. We gave the world this, all of these kinds of things instead of, oh, you were just a victim because our history has never been about us being victims. It, it's just not part of what Blackness is. It is uh, triumph. It is resilience. It is the thing, so many things that we have given to the world. So um, for me, I use the month to celebrate all of that. Uh, and I mean, I do it all throughout the year, but I amplify it uh, definitely uh, in February. Wow. Well, that is what a perfect place, I think, to wrap it up. It was a beautiful answer. Beautiful. Um, okay. So thank you so much, Dwayne. I really, it's been great to chat with you. I've known you for a long time. And um, yeah, I, I feel like I'm getting to share uh, some of, of conversations I've heard you have um, with the viewers here at Brickyard. So it's a real pleasure. Um, and I'm also really excited because you're going to be doing a full set of poems. We've already got uh, one poem uh, called Maybe on uh, Brickyard, but we're gonna have a full set coming up. I think it's gonna be posted after the interview. I'm not quite sure we're in the in the past right now. <laughs> but um, So please check that out. So you can check out more of Dwayne's work um, you can follow Dwayne through uh, social media. Um, his website is DwayneMorgan.ca. And um, please check back. Again, we're, this is just the beginning. Um, I believe, as I said, we're in the past right now. Um, but I believe that this is going to be the first of our, our kickoff of Black History Month. So we're going to have uh, three more artists. So check back to see who we have featured. Um, and ongoing uh, showcases like this for the Intersectional Poetica program. Um, you can find out more about these showcases and what we have cooking at Brickyard by signing up to our newsletter, which you can find at brickbooks.ca. And please, please, please like, share, subscribe. Um, everybody says that, but it's a real thing because um, we're, we're, we created here at Brickyard a profit sharing policy. So if any money is made from the, from the videos, we share that with the artists. So the more you help us support these artists, the more we can support the artists in a real way. That makes a cha-ching difference. <laughs> so um, thanks again, Dwayne, for coming. And spending my pleasure, my pleasure. Happy uh, Black History Month, everybody. I'm Andrea Thompson, and until next time, this is Brittany.